Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we're delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. Today, we, are going to, we will continue to take a look back at some of our special guests that we've had with us this past year. And we've had some fabulous guests. We have. I think we've done over 150 shows mm -hmm. in, in a year, and they've all been so absolutely special. And the theme for, this, uh, for these clips is a movement of converts, a movement of converts, and in celebration of Umani Vitae 50. So that should give you a little tease. You're gonna wanna see what's coming. Our hope candle is lit. Merry Christmas, blessed Christmas. We're in the Christmas season, and we're getting our fill of good teaching from the past that we might live into the future with Christ and his church and as part of the EWTN family. We'll be right back, plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, we are continuing our year in review. Now, this segment we're working with is the Movement of Converts. We have Dr. John Bruchalski, who was a lapsed Catholic, who became an abortionist, mm. who then came back, had a radical conversion, and came back to the Catholic Church, and now God has done a beautiful thing Absolutely. with his ministry. And then also Sean Corney. Right, co-founder of 40 Days for Life and executive director. And he's the one who really makes the point that the pro-life movement has really become in many ways a movement of converts, a movement that God has come to and has convinced these people of the evil of what they were promoting and advocating and doing. And they converted to Christ and to the church and to the essence of the pro-life movement and yes. become some of the greatest advocates on behalf of life. So there's hope for all of us. We may have been doing wrong at some point, but Christ desires to convert us and make us eloquent spokespersons on behalf of the gospel of life. Watch these clips, you'll be greatly encouraged. Let's take a look. I want to become a doctor. <laughs> and uh, you know, I was a history major and a biology major. And um, I wanted to liberate women from the chains of their fertility. Mm. And I wanted their goodness, their happiness. And I thought by controlling nature, rather than cooperating with nature, you'll bring happiness to anyone that comes to you as a patient. And so um, when I went to my residency, so I went to the University of South Alabama School of Medicine, but I did my residency in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And it was there in the first two years that I did abortions. So when I say I'm an abortionist, it's because once you buy into that mindset that children are sexually transmitted diseases, and that uh, you can't trump a patient's autonomy, and that abortion on demand is the state of medicine today. So can you imagine? Right. We're in this generation where millions of people the world over are being killed through abortion and euthanasia as part of my profession, like as a welcomed part of our profession. Yeah. And that's not counting the tens or hundreds of millions of frozen embryos. Right. So that's my profession. And when you buy into it and you want to be the best you can be, well then by golly, you got to work hard and you begin to do what you need to. Mm -hmm. So first you only do the little ones, the ones that are only six weeks and people talk about it's just tissue. Mm. But then you start doing the sick ones. So if a child had Down syndrome, mm. aborted. You know, even today, you know, we think over 90% of these children are being aborted today. Mm -hmm. God have mercy. You know that? Right. God have mercy on us. And sex selection. Oh, mm -hmm. well, you, just, you just go down the line. Mm -hmm. If you're 13 and you are sexually active and I know you can't control yourself, I'm going to stick a long-acting reversible contraceptive in you. Mm -hmm. If you have a sick child that um, is going to suffer, well, we'll just end it now at 20 weeks. And I found myself over and over and over and over again, my heart was getting hardened. <laughs> So uh, a friend of mine takes me to Mexico City 
at the end of my college days, um, and at the end of me, at the end of my medical school days, yeah. and uh, I'm at Our Lady of Guadalupe's shrine in Mexico City, and I hear something called, uh, "Why are you hurting me?" I heard it distinctly. Uh, I couldn't tell if it was male or female at the time. I thought it was female, maybe not. I just blew it off. I said, ah, it's, I'm too high. It's too, I had too much beer. I'm standing in here looking at this image that I, I remembered as a young man. So the, what the Lord does is he weaves this story of just not, it's just not one event. In my life, yes, I did feel at one point that it was just scales coming off my eyes. Yeah. But I have to tell you that it's more of a process. Yeah. I began to read studies where abortion, contraception, sterilization, in vitro fertilization, there's, there's some issues here, medical issues, medical problems, and we're kind of glossing over it. And all of a sudden, you began to find people in your life willing to stand up and talk to you. Mm. And that's when I'm in the middle of my residency and I deliver a five pound, uh, uh, excuse me, a 500 gram baby. I did a bad job in the history. I threw it on the scale because the woman's water broke. She didn't want it, so I just delivered it. The baby was over 500 grams. I had to call the neonatologist. I'm schizophrenic at this point. Mm. I'm taking care of a lady in one room, aborting a baby in another room, the same age, the same gestational age. And this wonderful pediatrician walks in the room, looks at me square in the eyes and says, Johnny, stop giving me tumors. For the first time, I was awoken to the fact that, uh, oh, by the way, uh, you're treating this young one pound baby as a tumor. And uh, it began to get at me. My eyes were, the scales popped off my eyes. And after the conversion, um, the Lord brought into my life. You know, once again, it's he loved me first. <laughs> and I just, you respond. Um, and, uh, it, you know, faith you know, Ephesians and John talk about, in John 3 and Ephesians 2, once you have faith, then there's deeds that flow from that mm. and works that flow from that. Faith because, without works is dead, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Yeah. And it's not about us earning or working. It's all of a sudden the Lord puts it in front of me. Now I understand about natural family planning. And he puts in front of me, once again, this may be my conversion, but it's not me. I stand on the shoulders of all those men and women who prayed through the night. My wife, Mary Lisa, and I, we were sidewalk counselors, and, and y'all were sidewalk counselors, and I think you have those moments at the end of the day. Part of it is the devil just tempting right. you for discouragement, but you're sitting there going, does anybody else care? Like, why, why don't we have more people out there? And that was definitely part of the motivation leading into 40 Days for Life of how do we get more people out here? It's not that people don't care. It's not that they don't, it, a lot of them don't realize that abortions are happening in their own city. And so I think that frustration leads us mm -hmm. to, to prayer and mm -hmm. desperation and, and then to action. And you know, we've had 35% of the 750,000 people who have participated in 40 Days for Life say this is the first thing they ever did mm -hmm. in the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. And so it has definitely been a point of entry for folks. Mm -hmm. Abortion's overwhelming. I mean, there's nothing, it's not like there's been 110 abortions in the history of America. Mm -hmm. You know, every single one is this gruesome act that breaks our heart, but imagine what it does to the heart of God. Mm -hmm. Imagine what it does to Our Lady. I mean, our Lord comes through the womb to save us from our sins and yet we've had 60 million abortions, and I think that that paralyzes people. I think they say, what could I possibly do? This is just unbelievable. Right. And we, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we, we, we can't have that response. We have to engage right. in, in one, one heart and one mind at a time where we live. And that's why people can take one hour mm -hmm. during a 40 Days for Life campaign. They can take 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. They can take five hours a day. But you have to take something to go out and to trust God to, to change, you know, a heart and a mind. And it does. It's devastating for the abortion industry. We've seen 97 abortion facilities close their doors, including the one in College Station that now is the headquarters for mm, 40 incredible. Days for Life. And so we, we have to trust God with our, our small effort and not get overwhelmed by the numbers. This is the 11th year of 40 Days for Life. And so praise God for that. It'll be the largest campaign we've ever had, 415 cities, 26 different countries just in this one uh, yeah. autumn campaign. Yeah. And so it, it's very exciting. You know, we know of 
uh, nearly 15,000 babies that have been saved Thank from you, abortion. Jesus. Thank you, um, And those are the confirmed saves. We've had 177 abortion facility workers mm -hmm. have a change of heart Incredible. and leave their jobs. You know, we have seen in America over half of all the abortion facilities closed since 1991. We see this unbelievable exodus out of the abortion industry since Roe v. Wade legalized it. I talk a lot about that in the book. I dig down deep into the abortion industry and why we see this sort of culture and movement of converts, the, the former workers, the abortionists themselves. Right. And I tell specific stories, but you know, that conversion gate only swings in one direction. Um, and that's beautiful. You know, we don't have moms who have six kids who run pregnancy resource centers mm -hmm. who wake up one day and say, I should have been running a Planned Parenthood abortion facility my whole mm -hmm. life. And then, you know, apologize mm -hmm. for it. And now we're on the speaking circuit. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have those people. And it, it, is, it is science, it is reason, and it is faith that is leading people uh, to become pro-life or to at least get out of the abortion industry if they're involved in it. Welcome back. Well, I know that you were thoroughly blessed by listening to those testimonies. Now, Dr. John, he's done an amazing yeah. work up there in Virginia, how God is using him to restore a culture of life to women, giving them health care with the Pregnancy Medical Center. He's still an OBGYN, yeah. and, but now he's on God's Team. I think it's Tepiak Ministries, and he yes. has people coming from all over the country to learn about being 100% pro-life as, as a physician, as mm -hmm. an OBGYN, and of course, Sean Carney, and all the lives that have been touched through 40 Days for Life, and he just tells you all the different stories of people who were once on one side, now on the other. You know, it's not going the other way. Right. And people who were once pro-choice, pro-abortion, are being radically converted, becoming incredible, like, 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 Saul to Paul yes. and uh, becoming articulate spokespersons because those who have forgiven much and Dr. Bukowski is forgiven much and those people that Sean's speaking about they've been mm -hmm. forgiven much those who have forgiven much love much and that's a word for us and for everyone out there that in this new year you would know the love of the Lord and be eloquent spokespersons on behalf of the gospel of life that all together will build a new culture of life we're going to take a break we'll be right back Please don't go away. Well, the next two clips that we're going to bring to you are in celebration of Humane Vitae because it was the 50th anniversary yeah. of Humane Vitae. And we bring to you two great docs that we had on our show, Dr. Thomas Hilgers and Dr. Christopher Stroud, and how God has used these holy men of God to repair and restore and redeem the culture of life. Yeah, Dr. Hilgers is known for the... Pope Paul VI Institute, named after the author of uh, Umane Vitae. And Dr. Christopher Stroud has an, an amazing testimony. Catholic, uh, was not practicing uh, true health care in the Catholic way and natural way. Went to confession, mentioned this in confession. Godly priest started directing his life. And then finally he comes to really come into the church by a friend who takes him out for a drink in a mm -hmm. bar and says, I have a document, Umane Vitae, I want you to read it. He says, I'll read it one day. Exactly. And so he says, read it now, yes. right here in the bar. And it totally changed his life. It wasn't alcohol that changed his life. It was Umane Vitae that changed It was changed the truth. Mm -hmm. So let's watch these powerful clips on, on really coming into the truth of Umane Vitae and practicing that as physicians. Take a look. It all got started when Humana Vitae was published, actually, because uh, when I was in medical school, I, I, uh, I was somehow interested in these issues. I don't know why, but, uh, and I kept reading about the commission that was releasing information, and I came thinking they're going to change the church's position. So that's kind of what I was expecting. Then when Humana Vitae came out, and it was um, an amplification, really, of the church's long-held teaching, mm -hmm. And um, 
So I thought to myself I should really get a hold of a copy of it and read it because I didn't believe then even what the <laughs> news people were saying about mm -hmm. things. So yeah. Anyway, I, uh, I did do that. I, I, I had to tell you, though, I went to the Newman Club chaplain at the University of Minnesota and asked him, where do I get a copy of Humana Vitae? And his remark to me was, what do you want to read that kind of trash for? Mm -hmm. So that was my first encounter. Mm -hmm. But I did get a hold of it, and I read it, and I was instantly converted. It's a, it's a magnificent document. People don't realize how magnificent it really is, because uh, one thing the church hasn't done a really good job of is, is teaching people about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that really struck me at the end of there is three parts to Humana Vitae, actually, and the third part is what's referred to as the pastoral directives. Right. And in the pastoral directives, Paul VI called for seven different groups to become involved. He identified mm -hmm. them, and two of them I related to. One was men of science, mm -hmm. one was physicians and healthcare professionals. And I had already done some research while I was in medical school, so I thought, I should be able to do something like that maybe. Mm -hmm. So I started actually in 1968 with my first right. little research project. Mm -hmm. What I've told a lot of people is that I read, oh, I read the whole thing of course, but paragraphs maybe seven to 11 or 12, something like that. I don't remember the exact paragraphs, but it's early in the document. And it was just uh, teaching what the church had always taught. And it didn't even mention contraception or abortion or anything, it was about marriage. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I believe in that. So I already knew why it was that they couldn't do, they couldn't change. Mm -hmm. right. Because what was being said was so important. It was literally the, the foundation of marriage. It was the foundation of family. It was the foundation of having children, all of those things put together. Yes. And so contraception wasn't gonna fit into that equation. Right. The day that Pope Paul VI died, which was August 6, 1978, is actually the day that my wife and I looked at each other, <laughs> sorry. I get really emotional mm -hmm. about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I know what my daughter's saying right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she always gives me a hard time about that. But it is, uh, we literally looked at each other and said, we're gonna build this institute. Mm -hmm. Everybody said it'd be a big failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was eight years before we could open it, seven. Yeah. And it was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. and we've been in existence now 31 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as a result of this whole effort, this new women's health science of NAPRO technology, natural procreative technology, where we look for the root causes of the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. We develop treatments that treat those root problems. We're not putting on people on birth control pills right. to cover it up. Mm -hmm. If you have menstrual cramps, cover it up. If you have endometriosis, mm -hmm. cover it up. It goes on and on and on like that. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it's really a whole new way of looking at women's health. It's a whole paradigm shift actually mm -hmm. in women's health. Mm -hmm. And it'll take a while for everybody to be aware of it because it, the medical students or medical schools aren't mm -hmm. much interested in it. They don't care about the science. It's very interesting because there's strong science that supports this. And nobody in most of these schools really gives a darn about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it tells you something about all this stuff they talk about, you know, and I'm the, I'm, I'm the new guy for, for women's health and all this mm -hmm. stuff, and, and it's, it's not so much the case. The women's health has suffered more than ever in the last mm -hmm. 50 years mm -hmm. uh, because of contraception, abortion, in vitro fertilization, all of these things. Mm -hmm. We have answers to all of that now. Mm -hmm. I was a regular OBGYN. I was practicing. I was going to Mass every Sunday. I was doing my best, but like so many physicians, I drew a line, and that line ended after communion on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And then I crossed back into the secular world, and I didn't think about it again until the next Sunday. But it happened for me in a confessional. Uh, without divulging too much, uh, I was still a relatively new Catholic, and I was running through my list of things in the confession. Mine might be longer than some. Um, and I said, Father, it bothers me that I'm prescribing birth control pills, and that I'm tying women's tubes, and I'm doing these things. Uh, and then I moved on. And all of a sudden, he has really large hands. His hand was on my leg. He said, what did you say? And I thought, no, I'm pretty new. <laughs> but they don't usually do that, I don't think. And I backed up, and I said, it bothers me. And he said, you've got to make a change. And he looked right through me. He said, you've got to make a change, and you've got to make it today. Wow. And he put me in touch with an amazing family physician named Dr. Patrick Holly, who was a Creighton Fertility Model NAPRA Technology doc. Um, and I asked him to help me. So we, we did what any good Catholics would do. We met in a bar, mm -hmm. and uh, he handed me a large print copy of Humana Vitae. Now, if anyone who's ever read Humana Vitae knows, you can't read it without being changed. Uh, it's that powerful. But he handed it to me, and he said, you need to read this. And he said, you need to read it now. 
Wow. So we went through it line by line. At the end of that discussion, I was cooked, I was convicted, I was finished. There was no more prescribing for me. Mm. How is that happening though in your life and in your heart? Like you, you get that truth, but as you get up and walk out that door, it's gonna change your practice. It's gonna change things. I was scared to death, yeah. but make no mistake. Yeah. I was scared to death. I told my wife, I said, I think we have to do this and I think we'll fail as a result, but we have to do it. And as I probably mentioned in our last show, I married up. Mm -hmm. And so my wife said, we'll go there. If that's yeah. where you think we should go, that's where we'll go. And we went there. The truly amazing part about the conversion story is what happened next. I sent out 2,000 letters to my patients that said, I'm no longer practicing this way. I'm gonna practice like I'm a Catholic physician, not just a physician who happens to be Catholic. I was ready for there to be no patients to see. Instead, my practice exploded. We had more patients than we could possibly see. For every one that I lost because of the pill, we probably picked up five more that wanted to see me because of the absence of contraception. So you distribute Umani Vitae? To anyone that'll take it. It comes up so often. Here's something to read. You know, it's interesting. Relationships take trust, and trust is repeatable behavior over time. So I have the chance, all of the physicians in my practice, to see women through the continuum of their pregnancy. Then they come back for their postpartum visit, and they want to talk family planning. Well, they trust us by this point. Mm -hmm. So we can say in love, in a trusting way, you, you can manage the size of your family, and you don't have to use artificial contraception to do it. That's something they just don't hear uh, nearly often enough. As I think about all of the problems that we're confronting in a society today, if you had to put one label on it, I would call it the destruction of family. Mm. Because the relationship between men and women uh, and their marital embrace has never been attacked so effectively as it's being attacked today. Humana Vitae speaks to the absolute beauty of that relationship, what it means. It doesn't mean that every couple has to have 10 children. I wish that my wife and I could have, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that. But it means that when a man and a woman give themselves to each other in marriage, it's a total gift. It's not a partial gift. Yeah. It's a total gift. Welcome back. Well, I know that you enjoyed that beautiful segment on both these wonderful doctors because they are making a difference in the culture of life and they are assisting couples who are um, experiencing infertility, really having struggles, going yeah. to the root cause, and God is using their talent, their abilities, to bring lives to families, to the culture, and to the whole world. And there's these two doctors, as well as other physicians that really come into this conversion and awareness and zeal to practice medicine with a Catholic moral mm -hmm. compass, uh, they're teaching others. So you'd yes. be encouraged. They're working with other physicians. Physicians are coming to them, seeing how they do what they do. They're having conversations. Physicians are stepping out in faith because this could hinder their practice. They might not have as many people that want to use them. But as they really step out, they are finding there are more and more people that want what is best for them. Mm -hmm. Many of them aren't even Christian people. They just know it's, it's good health and well-being. Special word about Umani Vitae and its 50th celebration. Umani Vitae was right 50 years ago. It'll be right 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years mm -hmm. from now. It is a natural law. Truth it is the law of nature. Truth, and it will always be true. And it's so essential at this time, in the midst of a culture of death, in a throwaway culture that we have Humane Vitae, the transmission of human beings, the transmission of human life, that it's about children, it's not just about adults. What's good for children? What's good for them? It's called marriage, it's called the family. And those of us who have violated uh, the way of family and marriage and, and so on, this mercy, grace, and forgiveness uh, for us. Uh, you can also get the Humane Vitae study guide uh, at Religious cat Catalog, EW10RC.com. Dot com, a study guide to Imani Vitae. I had the privilege of editing that study guide. And we, I think we show that at the end of every show. So please get that. It's, it's a beautiful thing that you can use for yourself and for your marriage and for your family. It means so much for us uh, to be here with you. Thank you for being an important part of the family. We look forward to the best year yet mm -hmm. for EWTN. And no matter what happens in the future, we don't know what's going to happen in the future but we know who's holding the future. That's Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He will prevail and life, marriage, and the family will prevail. You be encouraged. Keep it on EWTN.
Bye now.